They are the most powerful organized crime group in Western Europe. They kidnap tens of thousands of people, businessmen, politicians, journalists, and their family. They make tens of billions of dollars every year in a sophisticated drug trafficking network that's underpinned by widespread corruption, racketeering, and murder. They laundered their criminal money through the highest echelons of the Vatican using a corrupt cardinal and a very compromised papal bank. And most people have never heard of them. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining us on Crime Waves. I'm Declan Hill, a professor of investigations at the University of New Haven. Each week, my students, this episode is Erin Griffin, Eric Krebs, and Alexia Miller. We investigate one aspect of crime, and today we're looking at Italy's preeminent organized crime group, the Nedrangheta, and their links with Vatican officials. Our expert is Antonio Nicasso. And look, it's almost impossible to speak about this world without mentioning his name. Antonio is an academic. He's a professor at Queen's University in Canada, and he's also an author of more than 30 best-selling books on organized crime. One of them, Bad Blood, is the story of the Rizzuto family in Canada, and it's become a popular series on Netflix. However, we talked to him about his most controversial book, Holy Water, The Church and the Nandrangheta a story of power, silence, and absolution. It became an instant bestseller in Italy, but has received very little attention in the English-speaking world. So, Antonio, welcome to Crime Waves. Oh, my pleasure, Declan. Let's start. It's 2007. It's Germany in Duisburg, and the German police discover what? Tell us what they discovered and the effects it had. But the massacre of uh, Duisburg was... Uh, um, the final chapter of a, a violent family feud uh, that started in Calabria in a small town uh, called uh, San Luca, and uh, I think it exposed uh, the Ndrangheta worldwide. Uh, the Ndrangheta is a powerful criminal organization with uh, more than 150 clans, who uh, now dominate the European drug trade and who have a strong basis, at least in five continents, including the United States um, and, and, and Canada in terms of North America, but also South America and Australia, Europe, Africa. Uh, I, I think the success of this organization lies in how it fuses the business skills of a multinational corporate I finance with a, a, a stubborn grip on archaic rural traditions. And, and, and for so many years, the Dangata was underestimated. Consider an organization based in Calabria, uh, a, a second class a criminal organization compared to the most notorious uh, Sicilian mafia, the Cosa Nostra. With and all its Hollywood movies and TV series and stuff. And, uh, and it was almost like it went under the radar. And then German police discover, what, six, seven bodies one night in this small little German town of Duisburg. What, what was going on? You know, that, that suddenly this tip of this violent, bloody tip of the iceberg emerges in a little small German town. No, I think that was a... A, a, a boomerang, a mistake uh, by the Ndrangheta, because uh, uh, this uh, uh, this feud, this family feud, uh, was focused on Calabria, on the drug trade, uh, and, and, and was always uh, um, restrained to that specific area of Calabria. At one point, when family was unable to revenge the murder of uh, a, 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 a woman, the, the wife of a boss, uh, she was killed uh, probably by accident 
when the rival clan tried to kill the, uh, her husband. And because they were not able to revenge the, the murder, they decided to kill the six members or uh, associate of the rival gang in, in Germany because they, they knew that they were working in Duisburg uh, in a restaurant. And I think that was a, a big mistake because uh, before just a few people knew the Drangheta, was aware of the Drangheta, the, Duisburg massacre exposed the Drangheta world, uh, worldwide and uh, enforced uh, the, um, this uh, um, ruling body uh, that uh, uh, in some way has to mediate about conflict, to intervene and to say enough is enough. Now this field should end. And uh, I think what they decide to do was uh, very cinematic because uh, practically oh, the relative of the victim show up uh, at the funeral dressing in white and uh, like uh, the traditional way to express mourning dressing in black and, and, and that was a clear indication that business is, is more important in some case of a feud of family feud or, and, and so they decide to put aside the violence and to focus on on, on, on business. It strikes me in some ways, it's a little like the Valentine's Day massacre of Al Capone, Chicago and Murder Incorporated. It's really a sign, a symbolic sign to all of America at that time that there's the new guys on the block. It's Al Capone. He's pushing out the Irish mob and Murder Incorporated is gradually going to take over America. And the Duisburg massacre in Germany in this little small town, six or seven guys, bang, 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 they're all dead is really the Nandrangaka's kind of symbolic arrival on the big stage. Even though they've been coming up, even though they've had all these billions of dollars of trade, suddenly they're on the world stage. How did they get to be so powerful? What was their main money-making, uh, you know, system of money-making at that time? At one point, the Nandrangaka was uh, the leading uh, criminal organization in, in Italy uh, involved in kidnapping. Um, and they made uh, um, several uh, billions of liras, uh, um, I can say um, probably hundreds, billions of liras in the kidnapping industry. And they had this uh, uh, idea to invest the, uh, the money into the cocaine uh, business because they had the, some brokers uh, who lived at the time in Colombia. So they were able to uh, get the best price uh, and, and, and practically uh, they, they, they were the first one to focus on, on, on the cocaine. The, the, the Sicilian mafia made a fortune uh, for the involvement in the heroin trade. The Calabria Mafia decided to focus on cocaine and they took advantage of a specific moment in the history of the Sicilian Mafia. At one point, um, the Sicilian Mafia decided to uh, kill some politicians, uh, unreliable politicians yes. such as Salvo Lima, and then to challenge the state because uh, they were trying to, to um, avoid the, the final ruling of the Max trial of, uh, of Palermo. And, and, and practically they started to kill uh, judges, police officers, and that forced uh, for the first time ever, the Italian government to, to strike back. And while the Sicilian mafia was uh, involved in a fight, in a clash within the state, the Ndrangheta, uh, keeping a low profile, uh, they were making tons of money. And I think that was the crucial moment in the history of the Ndrangheta. Tell, tell us a little bit about, you know, the way you, the way you describe it, it just sounds so normal. They, they have a broker in Colombia who, who brokers an international drug deal for these guys and, and many international drug deals. How did those brokers, those meetings with the broker in Colombia and the mobsters from Nandrangata, how does that work? How do they get those meetings together? 
So in 1980, uh, some uh, uh, members of the Ndrangheta moved to Colombia. They married with the Colombian woman. They established themselves there. I think uh, not necessarily with the idea to uh, become a broker, but with the idea to move there and build a, a future in those countries. When the Ndrangheta decided to focus on Colombia, they discovered to have people, uh, relatives, because another thing so that we should keep uh, uh, under consideration is that uh, unlike other mafia groups, the Ndrangheta is held together almost entirely by actually blood relationships. It consists of extended family, often linked uh, by marriage. Uh, to form uh, uh, bigger units uh, known as uh, locali, and that's it's the the the, the base of the Ndrangheta. So it's clan based. It's it's the it's clan family and clan. Family. You don't you don't get into the Ndrangheta by by being a nice guy or working hard. You have to be born into that or being married or, into it or uh, adopt, uh, go adopted into the, 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 the that culture in the sense that I can uh, extend my family through uh, religious. Uh, uh, sacraments like marriage, uh, baptism. For example, I can identify a person and I ask him to be the best man of, of my wedding and he becomes family to me. Or I ask him to baptize my, my child and, 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 and he will automatically uh, uh, be part of my family with the, with the criteria that I can select the best man, the, the, the godfather of my childhood, I can uh, select my brother uh, or whatever I find within my family. So it's a very strategic selection. But it's a, it's a, it's also a, there's, a, there's a weird juxtaposition here, Antonio, between this, this deeply traditional culture of the clan, culture of these religious symbols, and this basically international globalized network that they're making around the world. There's really, it, it, it's really a strange comparison between this very, very traditional world and this huge international globalized world. Yeah, I think the strain of uh, the Ndrangheta or Ndrangheta-like criminal organization is uh, the ability to combine tradition and innovation, as you uh, clearly explained. Tell, tell, us, uh, tell us, Antonio, please, about that festival. There's a religious festival in Calabria. The whole town gets together. They all know the Nandrangata clan is going to be there. There's a mass. There's a Catholic mass said in the church, and they all gather there. Tell us a little bit about that, please. Yeah, but first of all, let's say that the use of religious symbols and ritual in the Ndrangheta, in the Mafia in general, in the Mafia initiation rites, imparts a pseudo-spiritual authority to the Mafia. So joining the Mafia is akin to joining a religious order, um, complete with the whole ritual, uh, special symbolic practices. So you imagine uh, this, uh, this celebration once a year in the mountain of Calabria, in the Aspromonte. Uh, many people uh, gather because they, uh, they claim to be devoted to the Virgin Mary uh, of the mountain. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people from uh, all over the place. Uh, uh, that was a great opportunity uh, at the end of the 1800s to organize a meeting and confuse themselves among the pilgrims that were gathering from all over the place. So the idea that if they would be stopped by police, they could say, oh, I'm going to the, the, the festival. I go to uh, show my devotion to the Virgin Mary. But at the same time, that was a great opportunity to get together. And that was uh, something that they established in 1896 and 1897. But and it's still it, carrying on. It's still, it, in the 21st century, it's still going on. Exactly, it's still going on. Practically, it's an important moment because they get together and they, in some way, ratify an election that took place in a different place, but they ratified the election of the chairman of the board. It's not the boss of all bosses, but it's the chairman of the board. The person that has to intervene is something happened between clans, between localities. There is a clash, there is a, some issue. And practically, they elect this individual every year. It's an annual election. And they created this body called the crimine, or province, or provincia. 
and practically is an expression of uh, the three main areas of the province of Reggio Calabria. And practically they, they look like a tribunal or they look like people capable to um, authorize the, the opening of a new uh, locale or new clan uh, uh, in any other part of the world. So but it's Antonio, what, what, what boggles your mind when you read these descriptions of these quasi-religious ceremonies on this hilltop town in Reggio Calabria, southern Italy, is there's thousands of pilgrims, there's Catholic priests, most of whom have nothing to do with the organized crime in any way. Some do, but most do not. You have the leaders of this international conglomerate of organized crime making you know, these decisions, and you have the police. And the police are watching these guys as it goes on. There's a strange dance that's happening here. At least in the past, uh, I think uh, at one point there was a, a, a silent agreement between the police and the Drangheta, a, a kind of agreement to, to stop uh, this ongoing uh, fight between uh, uh, criminals and police. Uh, those three days of the celebration, let's create a kind of a moratorium. Let's don't do anything. We are going there to show our devotion to uh, to, to the Virgin Mary. And, and, and practically, we won't do anything uh, wrong. We will, we will be involved in any sign of violence because uh, for example, in the past, at least at the beginning of the 1900, that was also a moment to um, uh, deliver some internal uh, uh, decision. For example, this guy uh, is, uh, did something wrong. This is a great moment to give him a lesson. And sometimes- You mean, you mean there'd be murders, there'd be killings, there'd be beatings, at kidnappings at the San Luca festival? Yeah at the end of the three days uh, would we'll find uh, bodies around uh, that uh, specific area. And so the idea of a moratorium that made them to be at the same place and to uh, practically stop any kind of investigation for those three days. Not anymore, because recently the police was, uh, was able to um, uh, record this important uh, uh, meeting for the first time ever. And they were able to start uh, a, a huge investigation uh, that uh, was uh, the equivalent of a max trial in Palermo in the fight against uh, the Ndrangheta. You talk about this brilliant term of your silent agreement, where there's an agreement between the police and the Nandrangaka, but nobody says anything. It's just there in the air that people do. Let's, let's broaden that, because there's a silent agreement between Italian, I'm putting my fingers in, in the air here, normal society, the lawyers, the accountants, the politicians, many of the journalists in Italy, and organized crime. Tell us a little bit about those silent agreements and in Canada and in Australia and in Mexico and in many other places. Tell us about those silent agreements with normal society and the Nandrangheta. When uh, I try to explain to my students what the mafia is all about, uh, I often use uh, the um, chemical formula for water. And I tell my students that the two atoms of hydrogen represent the violence, while the atom of oxygen represent the relation to power. Um, one of the characteristics of the mafia is to build a network of relationships, uh, bonding and bridging social capital, so internal cohesion and external relations. It's not enough to have an internal cohesion. You need to build the external relationship. I'll give you an example. If I have to laundry money, uh, I can't do that by myself. I don't have the knowledge uh, to, to, to move money worldwide. So I need professionals. I need chartered accountants. I need lawyers. I need brokers. Uh, and so the idea that there is a gray area, what uh, intrigues me so much is the fact that uh, they always find a way uh, to to identify the right person at the right time. For example, in 2008, when uh, when there was the financial crisis, mainly 
banks accept their money. And this is uh, uh, what happened everywhere uh, in, in, in the world. Uh, all over so the, the world. main banks were taking in the cash of Nadrangata and these organized yes, crime groups. Practically, yes, because uh, you have to consider that the, uh, now banks make easier the life of criminals in the sense that the, uh, at the time of Giovanni Falcone, uh, one of the strategy was to follow the money. Uh, that was the the good way to um, track down criminals. But now. Uh, you cannot follow the money because the money, the, the money stay in one bank as a collateral to assist the criminals to, to uh, get a loan uh, or, 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 or to get money from the same bank using the, 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 the drug money as a collateral. And, and so practically, uh, it's a system of guarantees, of a, a collateral system that is moving around. I, de I deposit $20 million in a, a branch of a Canadian bank based in an offshore country. With that money as a collateral, I can go to another bank, probably in the United States or in Canada, and said, I need the two, three, five million dollars because I have to, 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 to make an investment. And so the same bank, known that they have 10 million dollars so in their possession, of course, they will be able to um, provide a loan or a mortgage. It's an extraordinary company. step we, we've taken. And, and, and I just want to take a, a moment to, to, to talk to the listeners, because to listen to a world expert like Antonio Nicasio saying international banks, the, the banks that you may go to on your high street around the world, wherever you are, helping and aiding organized criminals sounds extraordinary. But take a look at the deferred prosecutions brought by the Department of Justice over the last 10 years in America. There was one bank, we can talk about this in another podcast, that not only was helping them launder, and when I say them, I mean one of the Mexican drug cartels, not only helping them launder billions of dollars, at what point this bank chartered a jet, flew the jet to Monterrey, Mexico, and handed it over to the drug cartel, i.e. so that they could transship drugs into America much more easily. These were the bank guys, and not a single one of them has served a day in prison. But they've admitted this in official documents. So what our world expert Antonio Nicasio was saying is not a surprise. It's a surprise to us as regular people. Antonio, I want to come back to the Nandrangata because I remember there was a moment I was listening to really the elephant in the room, the man that we haven't talked about, Niccolo Grateri, the modern day Giovanni Falcone, the modern day man of tremendous courage. He travels around Italy with armed bodyguards. He's a, he's a, a prosecutor, an investigating prosecutor. Uh, who's taken a tremendously courageous stance against Nandrangat. He's a personal friend of yours. But I remember listening to this gentleman in a theater in Reggio Emilia, where he was talking, he was saying, when you deal with organized crime groups, there is no gray. There is only black and white. Because if you choose to be a money launderer, for these guys who've gotten their money out of drug trafficking, murder, violence, kidnapping. There's no difference between you and them. Yeah, I, I, absolutely right. Nicola Gatteri and I um, grew up uh, in, in, in the same area of, uh, of, of Calabria. And um, I think uh, we share many things, uh, not only in terms of uh, principle, in terms of value, in terms of uh, family values. Nicola witnesses uh, the murder of many schoolmates. And, uh, and when I was six, a uh, classmate father was murdered in a broad daylight for refusing to deal with uh, the Ndrangheta. And, uh, and I, what I remember, is that uh, no of the witnesses in town dare to speak up. And um, it, everybody was whispering, everybody was keeping their eyes and mouth shut. And uh, instead, that episode forced me to be different. And I think Nicola Gatteri uh, followed the same pattern. Um, 
when you see violence around you, you have two options. One, to be indifferent. Also, who cares? I, I, it's not my business. Other, it's to ask yourself why. And so you build knowledge. And that's what I try at Nicola Gatelli, try uh, with the idea to, 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 to understand uh, the violence around ourselves. But uh, I, I, I have to say that if it wasn't for our family, uh, we would be probably like them, member of a criminal organization. Uh, because it was, your, it was your mother, was it not, that was very clear, even from a very early age, that Antonio Nicasa was not going to end up as an Andrangheta. Yeah, I, I, as I said, the difference was determined by the family we grew up in. My family made me understand right away that the only, uh, only sacrifices make human beings free. And, and uh, honesty, sacrifice, value, values are, you cannot ignore it. <laughs> honesty, sacrifice, values. Those are what uh, you learn within a, within a family. And, and that's what made me different from uh, many other uh, friends and schoolmates uh, who choose uh, to, to join the, the, the Drangheta. And, and, and probably, I think I can share that uh, because uh, uh, Nicola uh, and I, we have the same, uh, uh, family, social, economic background. I think that was uh, uh, probably uh, forced Nicola to be a different man and uh, to become a magistrate with the idea to, to create and to contribute to create a better society. Let's make the transition there to something that our listeners really want to know, because we talked about silent agreement. We've talked about there being no white and black, uh, excuse me, white and black. There's no gray and that a whole bunch of Canadian, Australian, Mexican, American, Italian society has not only tolerated, but has helped the Nandrangheta. Now, it's the most shocking and surprising one of all, which is that you and Nicola Grateri, this, this extraordinary prosecutor in Italy, were able to demonstrate that there was money laundering at the, at the Vatican Bank of this drug money, this criminal gang's money. Tell us about that, please. But, uh, prior to the entry into effect uh, of the anti-money laundering law in uh, Vatican uh, City, many investigations uh, uh, had highlighted the use of the Vatican Bank for money laundering operation. Um, I remember some comments from uh, important uh, uh, Vatican Bank representative officials. So they will say, with the money we earn from this type of operation, we've, we found that we finance good works, missions. Uh, and, 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 and I. Uh, so they would justify taking drug money, money that was earned by killing people or kidnapping and people saying, well, at least some of it we do good, good things with. Yes. And, and I think. Uh, um, uh, at one point, uh, um, the suspicions of many uh, countries uh, focus on uh, Cardinal Marcinkus, no, who was the president of uh, uh, the Vatican uh, Bank. And that was a moment when, uh, through the Vatican Bank, many criminal organizations were able to launder money world, uh, worldwide. You mentioned Roberto Calvi, the 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 the, the, the guard bankers, Mike Michele Sindona, um, and Roberto Calvi again for our our listeners was a very strange case. I mean, there'd be many novels, there'd been a couple of films about him, but Roberto Calvi was known as God's banker. And in one June night in London in 1982, a couple of years after that weird year of the three popes, where one pope dies, another pope comes in an Italian, and he dies incredibly quickly in two, three weeks, and then another pope comes in. And there have been all kinds of speculations, all kinds of discussions about this. But then Roberto Calvi, the man who was running the outside bank for the Vatican officials, is found hanging, dead underneath the Blackfriars Bridge in London. And since that moment, there've been a number of investigations about the organized crime connections in that, in the Vatican. What was the Nandrangheta specifically doing with the Vatican, um, the Vatican Bank? No, I think it, the, the, there was not any, any specific involvement. I think the Nandrangheta 
at one point to use uh, uh, the Vatican Bank to launder money like many other criminal organizations. I don't remember. That sounds pretty specific. I mean, if I they're using the bank. I remember that uh, in many cases there was uh, a request of cooperation sent to the Vatican uh, government. I, I remember uh, all the time those uh, requests of cooperation uh, uh, being refused by by Vatican officials. Uh, when, uh, for example, uh, Matsinkus was under investigation, uh, mm, there was a request uh, to, 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 to interview him and, and, and the Vatican never accept any, any request of, uh, uh, of collaboration. Uh, and we, we've got to remind our, our, our listeners, the Vatican not only is a symbolic, powerful center for the, the Catholic religion, the popes, the cardinals, so it's got a tremendous sacred importance to, to, to many people. It also is its own country. And it's kind of a weird country isn't it, Antonio? Because it's like, a, it's like six blocks in the center of Rome. So you don't really know. One moment you're walking along a, a street in Rome, and then you've, you've crossed over the street. There's no border, there's nothing, and you're into a completely different country. And I guess the finance rules in that other country in the middle of Rome are completely different. Exactly. At one point, Andrangheta was investing in laundry money through the Vatican Bank, but also through the Bank of San Marino, uh, another similar kind of country uh, uh, within uh, Italy. And, and, and that was a, a, a perfect way to uh, ship money everywhere to, to, to purchase narcotics, to invest to invest the money. And, and, and I think uh, at one point, uh, even the Vatican realized that, uh, that they had to do something. That's why they decide to introduce more transparency, more, more, uh, to introduce a legislation similar to other country legislation to investigate proceeds of crime, money laundering, and any kind of investment that were uh, allowed without any issue, any problem uh, before. And, and when, did, when did the Vatican look themselves in the mirror, excuse me, uh, let, let's be very clear. We're not talking about the Pope. We're not talking about the Cardinals. Well, with one exception, we're talking about Vatican bank officials with one Cardinal who was implicated with that. When did that change in attitude inside the Vatican institutions occur? Well, I can say the last uh, probably 10 years, but uh, just to give you an idea, I remember a meeting with the, the uh, son of uh, uh, Roberto uh, Calvi, uh, a very intelligent man uh, who live in, uh, in, 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 uh, in Canada. And, and he told me about a letter that uh, um, Marcinko sent to uh, Roberto Calvi. That's the cardinal that we were talking about, that one particular cardinal, yes. The president of the Vatican Bank. And the cardinal. To yep. Roberto Calvi and thank him for the support that uh, Roberto Calvi, through the Banco Ambrosiano, the private, the one of the largest private bank in, in Europe, uh, the support that this private bank provides to Solidarność in this, this union, this Polish union. In uh, Poland, which overturned the communists. Exactly. Or, or helped overturn the communists, yes. Exactly. And, and practically said, my, in that letter, I remember uh, the word, my boss was thankful to you for what you have done for Solidarność. Of course, there was not a direct reference to John Paul II. Uh, but uh, uh, one could ask who could be the, 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 the boss of the president of the uh, Vatican Bank, uh, who could have had an interest in, 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 in providing some funding to Solidarność. So I don't want to question Solidarność, the activity, the importance, but just to, to give you an example of how those things can- uh, Intertwined uh, and connect. And we're not, by the way, saying John Paul Exactly. Knew the Nendrangata. We're not saying that. We're not saying those things. But we are saying the connections between this particular cardinal who is doing all kinds of dirty things and, and has been shown to have done this, not only in your book, but in many Italian investigations, and the connections he's had was quite high. And, and if you may, uh, Declan, I would like to add another uh, uh, 
important uh, information. I don't like this uh, theory of conflict, of uh, conspiracy. Yes, but, yes. Uh, but but uh, thinking and consider how some time event can uh, trigger so many uh, conspiracy theories. You mentioned about the Pope uh, John Paul uh, replaced Paul the Sixth, and this Pope lasted for only 33 days. During those three, 33 days, he made an important decision. So to remove Mercinkus from uh, at the top of the, the Vatican Bank. Really? Uh, Yes, that wow. was one of the decisions that uh, John uh, Paul uh, uh, made in story three days. Sorry, not John Paul, Paul VI, the guy who dies mysteriously after no, only 33... John Paul, John Paul yes. uh, 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 lasts for 33 days, and during those 33 days, he removed Marcinkus, the Cardinal Marcinkus, as a president of the Vatican Bank. Uh, then John Paul II was uh, 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 elected Pope and replaced John Paul, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in practically one of the decisions that the John Paul II made was to restore Mercinkus uh, 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 at the top of the Vatican Bank. Why? We'll never be able to answer that kind of question. Now, you, you have written 30 best-selling books. They're available in multitudes of languages. A number of your books have now been turned into Netflix TV series. We'll talk about that on another occasion. But what was the reaction like in Italy after you came out with Holy Mafia a few years ago? What, 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 how, did, how was that greeted by the critics? I expect uh, some uh, reaction, but I never expect a, a strong reaction. I did not expect a, a strong reaction from some church officials. Because we, Nicola Gartel and I, we never talked of accusing the church, but of highlighting some individual behaviors in the relationship with the mafia. So a, a, a sort of excessive tolerance uh, 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 towards the mafia in a given territory. Uh, 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 instead, the reaction was strong. I remember interview from bishop, from priests, accusing us uh, uh, of being disrespectful uh, towards the church. But our intention was not to accuse the church uh, as an institution, but to say that some priests, some bishop, they were not follow what were the uh, direction and the guidance of, uh, of the church. After the book was published, uh, um, the Pope uh, uh, Francis, for the first time ever, decided to excommunicate the uh, uh, mobsters. And, and I remember that. It was an extraordinary moment uh, across the Catholic Church where a, uh, where a, a Pope walked into a, a mass and said, enough. No more connection. You can't take sacrament if you're a member of organized crime. And, and what a shockwave that sent. Yes, uh, that was a, an important uh, moment in uh, 2009. But again, uh, that's just the general direction. The Pope clearly said, if you belong to a criminal organization, you cannot be part of, uh, of, 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 of our family or our, of, of a church, of a community. But, in, but uh, I think uh, uh, many uh, priests uh, continue to uh, silently support uh, certain uh, attitude of a mobster. Why a mobster really like the idea to be close to a priest? It's because they have to normalize their action, their activity. They want to be considered a community-oriented people, people that are able to raise money to uh, renovate a church or uh, raise money to um, organize a celebration of the patron saint of, of a small town. So, in, in some ways, Antonio, to get back to your metaphor that you use for your students, H2O, the H in that metaphor is the violence, the racketeering, the kidnap, the murder that the organized crime is doing. The O, the oxygen, is in this way spiritual laundering so that they're giving these guys the oxygen of normality. We have to close up this podcast. I really want to thank you for, for taking the time and, and, and sharing this amazing insights and investigations. But 
Is there one thing you'd like our listeners, many of whom are fascinated with organized crime, many of them who know your work before, but are really going to go out now and, and, and look at Holy Mafia and all your books. Is there anything that you'd really like to, to make sure that they know and keep in their minds? I want to say that uh, sometimes uh, law enforcement focused on the uh, criminal organization and not on the corruption. And I think uh, uh, the, the trend now is the mafia is keeping a low profile. It's uh, less violent and more business oriented. And, and, and they use uh, corruption more than violence. So I would like people, uh, viewers, uh, to understand that without the, the relations with the viral, with the professional, with the upper world, the mafia would be like coffee without caffeine or milk without lactose, just to use another metaphor. But that's what we should understand, the importance of the people who support from outside the mafia. And so when we're thinking about the mafia, we have to think about a combination between the upper world and the underworld. That's a perfect combination to succeed. Without the oxygen of the upper world, the underworld would, would suffer would practically be just a bunch of people, like a, a, a group of oligarchs. Thank you so much, Antonio. This has been enlightening. Would love to have you back sometime to come back and tell us about the Rizzuto's, to tell us about this other work, to tell us a little bit, if you wouldn't mind, about growing up in Reggio Calabria. But for now, thank you again, Antonio, for joining us on Crime Waves. Hey, it's Declan. Uh, thank you so much for listening to this uh, episode. We really want to thank Antonio Nicasio both for being on the program and also his work. It's extraordinary what he's done and what he's risked over the years investigating the Nandrangheta. Look, if you like the program, please um, subscribe to us or like us or promote us in some way on social media. It's super important. And we'll see you next week for an extraordinary episode on Whitey Bulger and the corruption inside the FBI and their organized crime. Thanks very much. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.